We will continue our afternoon session with our uh, valuable professor Kadir Durak from Erzurum University. So Kadir uh, is a distinguished position in Turkey. He is one of the rare uh, academicians who is trying to do quantum technology, both from practical point of view and take challenges experimentally, as well as as a good understanding of theoretical quantum communication as well. Um, <coughs> today, we are going to listen his uh, lecture. Uh, and uh, we have only one uh, talk in the in this afternoon session. And in the evening, we have a talk from Barry Sanders. And uh, I would like to also mention that Kadir Ojai is also is uh, trying to build some uh, also kind of startup uh, company on quantum technologies and filling a uh, very crucial gap in, in our country in this respect. So maybe today he can also mention a few words about these uh, challenges as well. So we look forward to listening to him. Kadrojan, whenever you like, you can start the lecture. Uh, thank you very much for, for this nice introduction and the uh, nice organization, uh, the organizers as well. I'm trying to share the screen. Uh, can you see? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so basically today I will be talking about the, the need for the quantum key distribution uh, and uh, the countermeasures on the quantum side, what can be done and what has been done so far. So, and tomorrow I will be continuing with the experimental challenges, details of the experimental setups and uh, practical applications. So uh, basically the title of the talk is, uh, so since it is two uh, uh, different, so this is kind of the ABC of the uh, quantum key distribution. So the cryptographic security threats and the QKD as a solution to this problem. So, uh, Let's define with uh, uh, defining the cryptology. So it consists of two uh, uh, class of studies, cryptography and cryptanalysis. Cryptography is basically pro trying to provide a secure communication and uh, uh, cybersecurity in general terms, let's say. And cryptanalysis is the, the opposite of it, trying to break the code and uh, get the key and listen to other people, intercept the signals, etc. So for cryptography, we can uh, divide it into two uh, subclasses, symmetric encryption and asymmetric, or in other terms, public key cryptography encryption schemes. The most common uh, examples of symmetric encryption is uh, the, uh, uh, the advanced encryption standard, which is the AES. Uh, nowadays, we use this one for uh, uh, symmetric encryption. For the asymmetric ones, the most common one is the RSA. Uh, there is also this elliptic, elliptic, elliptic uh, curve cryptography. And the cryptanalysis, there are passive and active attacks, but I'm not going into details as our main focus is on the cryptography side. So when we uh, analyze a crypto, crypto system, there are seven uh, items that we need to uh, pay attention to. The first one is the message that we want to deliver. Without message, cryptography doesn't mean any, anything encryption algorithm and the decryption algorithm number two and number five these are symmetrical uh, the same thing basically if we are using symmetric encryption in the opposite uh, sequence uh, encryption key uh, encrypted message which is uh, established by uh, mixing the encryption key with the encry uh, encryption algorithm uh, and then we use the message uh, to have the encrypted message so and then we need to also consider the eavesdropper because uh, we cannot consider a crypto system without checking the security aspects. Uh, so cryptography has been known for a long time. There are early studies about this. So the, the one example is the hieroglyphic. Uh, you know, these ones from the uh, uh, pyramids and, you know, like this ancient Egypt. And then the Caesar cipher is uh, something no better. So Cleopatra was using one of these schemes for uh, uh, communicating with the Caesar. Caesar provided this key. Key is two, for example, for this example. And then basically what you do is in the alphabet, you shift the letter with number two. So if it is A, so the B, C, right? We just shift it two, then it becomes C. So if we do the same thing for all the letters, we have an encrypted message here. So the key here is two, and the encryption algorithm is shifting the letters in the alphabet with the number of the key. So uh, this is the sim simplest uh, example of the symmetric algorithm that I can give uh, right now. So um, as you see, attack at dawn, a military command, say suddenly becomes something that we need to decipher. So, and then there's technography. So uh, burying some uh, features, some sig symbols, signals, 
inside the uh, paintings and all these things. It's a, there are common examples in the Renaissance uh, paintings, for example. And if you know this Da Vinci Code, the movie and all these things, so you, you, must, you must be familiar with these things. And then there's a recent one, Higgin uh, Array Cipher. This is a, a little bit more advanced version of the Caesar Cipher, actually. But now the key is a word or something. For example, this is the place that I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm located at this location in Pakistan right now, Natia Gali. So N is 14, A is 1, T is 20. So if we have this uh, message, for example, that I get on, so N plus A, 1 plus 14, it becomes 15. In this case, it becomes O. So the first letter becomes O. So that's how we do the encryption. You can keep using the same signal over and over again. So that is the core of the beginner cipher, but it can be also like dynamic. The key is not static, like it's, you know, one word or something. It also changes from time to time, date and location. All these things may also uh, uh, be used for uh, key. So for symmetric cryptography, I must say like this, uh, uh, this cryptographic scheme is very common in the Cold War times. Uh, people were using this very commonly and there were spies uh, let me just give you an example, for example, if I can find. Yeah. So, for example, this is a Russian uh, one type pad uh, used for symmetric encryption, which was captured by MI5 dish. Uh, so, basically, the, the Cold War times, you see these agent things so common because they were used for delivering the key for encrypted communication. And uh, the security of this uh, communications uh, crypto system is relied on the secrecy of the key or secure delivery of the key to two parties for communication and the randomness of the key. The key has to be random. So for example, this is not a good key because there are three A's, for example, in, I don't know, like 10 letters or something. Yeah, 10 letters and three of them is A. So this is not a good uh, way of uh, creating a key. It should be totally random. There should be no pattern. And the secrecy is the most important one. And uh, so that was a problem. That's why the uh, certain uh, number of people should be spies or couriers to deliver the keys to uh, secure, securely deliver the quantum key. And then once the computers uh, had this certain computational power, uh, that crypto scheme uh, has changed to asymmetric or in other words, uh, public key cryptography schemes. In public key cryptography, there's a repository. You have to trust the repository, okay? They are the, the one uh, announcing the keys. Just announce the numbers, and from the announced number, uh, uh, sender one, or let's say host one and host two, understands which key they will use for communication. So, for example, uh, if the repository announced the, the public key uh, for, for host one, the host one uses this number for encryption, and host two knows this key as well, it uses for decryption. And if the communicating demand, communication demand or secure communication demand comes from host two, it gives the other number. Actually, uh, the number is used for dec uh, decryption and encryption. This is actually uh, relied on this uh, mathematically one-way difficulty problems. The most common ones are prime uh, factorization problem and uh, and the discrete logarithm. So discrete logarithm also like the, it can be simplified uh, to uh, uh, a similar problem like the uh, prime factorization. Eventually, it becomes a period finding problem. Uh, so what is the problem if there are these uh, nice crypto schemes working fine? The problem is uh, uh, there are uh, uh, quantum computer studies recently, and they can effectively use Shor's algorithm to find this prime factorization problem uh, because they have some exponential speed up compared to the classical computers. I will talk about the details of this uh, uh, RSA and this uh, uh, public key crypto schemes a little bit more detailed. But uh, so when I was giving this kind of talks, like, uh, I don't know, seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, someone in the room working in the cryptography uh, field would definitely ask, well, you're uh, trying to find a solution to a problem that doesn't exist yet, which is fair, actually, fair point. So we don't even know if the uh, practical quantum computers will be ever built or not. Uh, most probably yes, but it's not even sure. So, but it's, uh, it, we don't know when. So it, does it make sense to spend so much effort on uh, finding some solution to problem that doesn't exist yet? Uh, the answer is yes right now, because uh, NSA is the National Security Agency of US. It's, uh, you know, in the movies, we use, usually see CIA, but CIA is just, you know, all times, Cold War times, it was important. Right now, NSA is more important because it's dealing with the signal intelligence. And uh, NSA published this question and uh, answer uh, announcement in 2016. You can find it, it's publicly available. Uh, usually they provide crypto suits and they say like within the next 30 years, there won't be any technology being developed uh, that can break these codes or, the, uh, you know, uh, decipher the crypto systems. So they say a few decades in this state, but it's 30 years. 
but uh, uh, they also said here that you know we cannot promise that anymore because the people are studying quantum computers if uh, practical quantum computers being built uh, maybe don't they don't announce this and if we don't know about this then the crypto systems are not secure anymore therefore we do not give such a guarantee anymore <clears throat> this was a big uh, uh, you know impact actually on the uh, uh, grants and the efforts on the quantum key distribution systems so but uh, we know that uh, uh, asymmetric key crypto, uh, crypto, uh, public key cryptography systems are not secure against the quantum computer assisted attacks but symmetric ones are secure uh, in a way that you know the the quantum computers does not does not provide an exponential speed up i will give an example of how powerful term is exponential uh, but for symmetric algorithms they can only apply this brute force, force attack for certain certain uh, search algorithms like uh, grover search and in that case it only provides a quadratic speed up which is not that important because you can just double the key length and uh, take a precaution against this kind of attacks therefore symmetric algorithms are back on uh, just like this Cold War times. <clears throat> so just one, uh, just to give an idea how this quantum computer finds these uh, keys, uh, prime numbers uh, so effectively, uh, it's because it's uh, it, the problems can be optimized in a way that a quantum computer can solve effectively. So therefore, uh, the, the quantum computer itself is very important, but at the same time, the optimization of the problem itself is very important. That's why this algorithmic part of the quantum computation is as important as having a quantum computer. So this is just to give an example how it works. It's just an analogy. Of course, it is not an accurate uh, example. There's no quantum going on here. Just to show how the quant uh, optimization uh, uh, helps solving the problem in an easy manner or faster manner. So as you read here, you can just follow with me. I mean, the, the, there's a Salton, he has one kg of gold and consisting of 100 grams of uh, this uh, gold uh, uh, masses, slabs. And he wants to make 100 coins of each 10, 10 grams. He distributes to 10 dollars to make this. And then each dollar uh, makes 10 coins, which it, it will be 10 grams. In this case, um, everything should be fine. But in the, uh, the Sultan hears that, you know, uh, one of the jewelers uh, has stolen the uh, one of the golds. In this case, he's making the coins out of nine grams. And then he gets angry and then he calls his vizier and tells the vizier that, you know, uh, and then he uh, calls all the jewelers as well. The jewelers are in line, like one to 10, one to three, four, five, until 10. And then ask the vizier to use this uh, measuring device that you see on the picture only once find which uh, jeweler so, uh, stole the gold. So this is a puzzle actually, I mean, it's an old one, but uh, it's a nice one as well. So of course you need to do more lots of measurements to actually identify which one is this. But what you can do is optimize the problem. I mean, if you have the opportunity, you optimize the problem by using it once, you can still do this. That will save time and, you know, uh, uh, how would I say, computational power effort, let's say. How does it work? So you just take one gold from the first uh, uh, jeweler, two golds from two coins from the second jeweler, three coins from the third one, and tenth from the, uh, 10 uh, coins from the tenth one. So in total, you have how many? Uh, 55, right? 55, uh, 10 times 11 or two, yeah, 55 coins. And if everything was right, it would be 550 grams, right? Uh, but if, for example, the third one stole the the gold then the, his golds would be nine grams and there are three of them therefore it will be 547 grams instead of 550. so if it is 545 it means the fifth one if it is 540 it means the tenth one uh, stole the goals so you can just use it once understand how much is missing and then identify which jeweler stole so basically it's not only about like using the quantum computer and then write your codes and then it solves the problem for you that happens our classical in our classical computers, but not in quantum computers. You only have atoms, ions, or superconducting qubits. You need to know how to optimize the algorithm to solve the problems. And Shor's algorithm is one way to do this. So basically, I just gave this example to uh, like uh, 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 quantum Fourier transform is this, by the way, this uh, measuring device. You need to optimize this to use this device just once. So and the quantum Fourier transform is the discrete word version, of, uh, sorry, uh, quantum version of the uh, discrete Fourier transform in the classical manners. So anyways, this is just an example of how the uh, calculation can be, can be optimized. Of course, you still need a, con a quantum computer to do the final measurement. The measurement measure, measuring device here is the quantum computer, and you can do things a lot, a lot faster. 
<clears throat> we talked about the exponential speed up. Uh, we didn't we didn't actually pay, uh, spend time on how does it work. So let me just elaborate it a little bit. For example, um, the, the public key, uh, cryptography works the following way. There's a number n, which is f uh, announced uh, publicly. And then once n, uh, n is followed, let's say I'm communicating with Özgür Hocam. Özgür Hocam is going to use Q for encryption. I will use P for encryption. And when Özgür Hocam messages me, I know that he is using Q for encryption. I will use Q for decryption as well. So, and you know, if you look at these numbers, 21 is the uh, multiplication of the prime numbers, three and seven. As you see, it gets more complicated. And then once you, there's a number here, there are no smart ways of finding these prime numbers. And these are still small numbers. Uh, RSA usually uses more, uh, numbers with more than 2000 digits. And these are the prime numbers that are found in uh, like the, the, uh, the years that are found also given here. As you see, we need lots of computational power to find these kind of prime numbers. Of course, these are the uh, public known ones. <clears throat> the repositories that I mentioned, just like NSA, NIST, these kind of establishments, they also have like uh, superior numbers, but we don't know them uh, publicly. But this was found in 2018, for example. I mean, you look at the numbers, which means the computers were powerful enough to go to this number, uh, and the computation uh, time is also uh, critical here because it takes long time to find these numbers. Uh, so th therefore, uh, uh, Prime factorization is a good problem for encryption in this case. But now think about this quantum Fourier transform, Schwarz algorithm, and the quantum computers. So the number of operations can be significantly lowered. I mean, this, this uh, function here tells, uh, tells an idea about like what is the operation number. As you see here, for quantum computers, it's much straightforward. Like less uh, operations can tell you what is the answer. So if that is the case, if you have the infinite uh, resources, of course, this is an approximation uh, to, to find some numbers here. Uh, see, instead of this many years, you can just find in 100 seconds if you have a really global quantum computer with full uh, uh, capabilities, you can do this at least potentially. So therefore, the actually the quantum, uh, sorry, uh, public key crypto systems are not secure anymore. And uh, another, uh, if I have to just give an example about the speed up, so like this is that hard, but uh, I have another example. I give you an example here that, you know, uh, time can be significantly lowered. Uh, Hocam. Yeah, so how many qubits for this 100 second estimation? Uh, Hocam, I just took, took some random numbers, so this, I, I, I don't know. So that's why I said, like, having all the infinite resources, you can possibly reduce the timelines, something like this. So it's about to actually just to give the ratio between them by looking at the operation time. I, I'm not like, see, it's not about actual simulation. So to give the exact numbers, I think it's a public but yeah, it's a publication uh, study, uh, but the number of operations is exponentially decreased. That's why the, the, uh, we can assume that uh, with a finite operation time, gate operation time, we can uh, provide an exponential speed up. Just to give an idea about the, what is the, the uh, meaning of the exponential, uh, let's give this example of the chessboard. The guy funds the chess chessboard the satranch, you know, the chessboard. And then the king wants to reward him with this one. And then he says, what do you want? And then he says, like, I just want rice. For the chessboard, the first square, I want one rice. Second one, two, one, two, two rice. Uh, third one, four. So the, like, it just goes by doubling it, okay? So what would you, what would be your estimate that, you know, in the last uh, square, how many uh, rice would be required in this case? So if you have to guess, I think our imagination is a little bit lacking behind the reality here. In the first row are eight squares. We have 100, uh, 155 grains. So this is still within our uh, you know, expectations. If you go to the half of the board, you already have around like 9 billion grains. This is more than a human can consume in their lifetime, roughly. And if you go to the last square on the board, 64th square, I don't even know how to read this number. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I'm not trying to attempt to read. I just made another, again, really, like sorry, a simple calculation. Let's assume that 100 rice is one gram. It means that that's 9 billion tons of rice. Uh, I, and I checked it. It's more than uh, uh, annual uh, production uh, of the whole world uh, <laughs> capability. So uh, exponential is that much. You just start with one rice, two rice, four. And then once you go to the end of the chessboard, you have 9 billion tons of uh, rice. That's huge. So that's why this exponential speed up is extremely critical. That's why people are spending so much efforts and money on the quantum computers. 
So uh, now that we know that the, the problem is there, so what are the precautions that we are taking it? Of course, the, the simplest precaution is, well, if the quantum computer can attack the Shor's, uh, Shor, with the Shor, Shor's algorithm, it can attack the uh, public key crypto systems, then we just find some other mathematical problems that the quantum computer cannot attack, right? That's very, very simple uh, uh, logic, straight logic. Uh, there are actually studies on this one, and there, there's a, a class of uh, cryptographic uh, schemes that people are uh, making research about. And I, I, I really appreciate this kind of research because it's cheap. Uh, it's not like quantum cryptography. You don't spend much on the equipment. Uh, you just find a new algorithm. But there is one uh, uh, note that I need to make here. Uh, well, uh, quantum crypto, uh, like people are spending so much money on the quantum computer and cryptography because there is Shor's algorithm, and Shor is Peter Shor is a physicist who published a paper in 1994. Right now, if uh, me or Özgürcan, like if we find a new algorithm that can like actively attack these kind of systems, I'm not sure if we should or we 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 would uh, publish a paper about it because now it's too critical. Like these kind of technologies are too critical. Therefore, if the new Shor's algorithms, if we don't know about them or if there's a question mark about them, then how do we know that our new crypto scheme is secure against it? That is why these uh, public key crypto systems that are based on uh, other mathematical one-way difficulty problems. Uh, we, we, we were only using the prime factorization and the discrete logarithm. So if you find some other problems, so we don't know if the, there are some algorithms uh, in uh, uh, some people's hands who has the quantum computer as well. But other than that, I think this is a very, very important branch of uh, 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 research scheme uh, where uh, you can take precautions against the quantum computer assisted attacks. So uh, if we have to a little bit, you know, give panic. Uh, so what can happen if uh, the uh, global quantum computers has the full capability that they can uh, uh, they can beat all the classical computers? Uh, capabilities. Well, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, risks uh, areas. One of them is e-commerce. Uh, any field that requires digital, digital signature, including a devlet, uh, banking industry, and defense, in the, uh, uh, defense industry, and then the cryptocurrencies as well. Uh, I know that there will be a question coming about this, so we shouldn't spend money on, like invest money on the cryptocurrencies. Uh, no, you can, no problem. Uh, if I have a quantum computer, I wouldn't try to steal your Bitcoins. I would have some more important problems uh, to try to solve or uh, uh, more advantages on my side. That's why uh, someone who has quantum computer would not be dealing with uh, stealing the cryptocurrencies. So even if the, the security threat is there, I don't think it's uh, the, the biggest uh, significance. So the cryptography is a very important scheme, although we don't feel it all the time, but we are using it actively as public, as citizens, regular citizens, we are also using this. Uh, but of course, there are more important fields. So for example, there was an example recently, in Germany, it was understood that Germany was trying to listen uh, Turkey for a long time, it was a diplomatic crisis. So that's why like cryptography can be really significant. And if someone has quantum computer, they would try to do this rather than try to steal cryptocurrency. Okay. So uh, what is the precautions? Uh, sorry, before I continue this, it's good jump. Uh, I cannot see time around me right now. So could you help me with the time? How much time I left? Well, the, according to our schedule, it should be ending quarter past three, but uh, we can be flexible. As I said, there is only one talk in the afternoon session. Uh -huh. yes, sure. so can I continue, John? Sure. sure. OK, thank you very much, John. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's talk about the cryptography uh, and summarize what's going on. So there are two types of cryptographic schemes, symmetric and asymmetric. Asymmetric ones are called public key crypto, key, crypto uh, systems. Asymmetric, asymmetric, asymmetric crypto systems are not probably secure because uh, quantum computers can actively, effect, efficiently uh, attack by using the Shor's algorithm. And the symmetric keys are secure, considered secure. By the way, quantum computers still have advantage compared to the classical computers for attacking the symmetric keys, it only provides a quadratic speed up. Quadratic is not that important, okay? You can always take precautions by just increasing the key length. And uh, the, the symmetric keys should be uh, used as minimum amount of times as possible. So what does it mean? For example, if you have 128 bits of key, we shouldn't use it for five minutes of communication for this video transmission because uh, 
if you keep sending the, using the same uh, key for encrypting the messages, one can apply the dictionary attack. So there is such a thing called dictionary attack. And to avoid that, you need to use the same key only for certain number of times. You should not exceed that. That means the quantum key distribution schemes should replenish the shared private key resources. So therefore, uh, the key renewal rate should be as high as possible for the symmetric keys to be secure against the quantum computer assisted attacks, which should be fine, by the way. Uh, just to give uh, a little bit uh, idea about like how does this work, uh, uh, maybe I should continue with this tomorrow if there's time limitation, otherwise I can continue, John. Uh, okay. I think uh, you are fine with this. Uh, if you wish, uh, you can plan to use an, an extended 10 or 15 minutes. I, it will just okay. be mm -hmm. Because I started late, so I don't want to. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's start with the quantum mechanics. Uh, so it sounds scary, but it's something that human developed and it's for humans. That's, for, that's, why, that's why you shouldn't be scared of any of these uh, fields, including quantum mechanics. So let's just give a brief understanding of how this quantum stuff works and how the quantum cryptography provides some solution to this, this kind of cryptographic uh, 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 threats, security threats. So this is the famous Schrodinger's equation. Uh, it's mathematically beautiful. There's this complex, it's actually very similar to this uh, classical wave, uh, wave uh, uh, equation. But it has this complex part here. And then uh, the thing is, you know, it's mathematically nice, but Schrodinger didn't know when the, uh, at the time that he uh, developed this equation, he didn't know uh, the interpretation of this wave function. Uh, the interpretation came from Max Born, and he said, like, you know, it could be the, its modulus square may give the probability uh, of existence of a certain parameter within a certain interval. So, just to give an example, let's say this is the x axis is the position, okay, position axis, and then the y axis is the modulus square of the wave function, and the modulus square of the wave function just gives some function like this. So, if you want to find the uh, probability of particle to be uh, the, between the point A and point B, you just need to integrate between these points, and then that gives you the probability. If you put minus infinity and plus infinity instead of A and B, you just get one, which means the particle exists. Okay, everything is fine so far. So, and then uh, if you do a measurement, of course, it's more probable that we, we find the particle at A, but let's say we found at C. We, we did the measurement, particle at C. Now everything turns classical. We know the particle's position, it's at C, it's a Dirac, uh, Dirac function, delta function, and this function is limited with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But forget about it for the time being. So now we know that particle is at C. Everything is fine. So basically, once you do the measurement, the wave function collapses, and then you have a classical position information. So the problem is, which was discussed in 19, 1927 Solvay's conference, recently we have seen the new version of that one, um, in that conference, they were discussing where was the particle just before measurement was done. So let's say the measurement is done at time t. If we consider the particle's position at t minus epsilon. Where would be the particle? So the, the first answer is coming from Einstein. It's from the realist then. Didn't know it because the wave function couldn't tell it to you. Maybe the quantum is not a complete theorem, but uh, you know it was somewhere. Whether you know or not, the particle was somewhere. You just didn't know it. Probability is uh, it's something like this. I just flip a coin and then close it and then ask you, is it uh, heads or tails? So now uh, you don't know it. It's 50% chance, but actually the, the coin has either heads or tails, right? One of them. It is certain, determined. Einstein was supporting this. And then the second answer is, uh, this is actually a uh, Copenhagen interpretation. It's uh, one of the uh, uh, the main logics of the quantum mechanics came from Niels Bohr. Uh, particle did not possess a position. You, uh, you made it have a position by doing the measurement. So before the measurement, it did not have a position. It was a probable to wave function. So I don't know what is the meaning of that. I still don't understand it, but uh, somehow this is the correct decision because its interpretations are correct. And the third one is, so you're just asking if you do a measurement before the measurement, where would it be is not a scientific question. So therefore there's no meaning to discuss. This is not so valid. So this was not so valid, but I still realist uh, physicist uh, right now today. <clears throat> we know that the answer to is the correct answer. So Einstein just gave an example to, Einstein just gave an example to 
uh, through his point that you know quantum mechanics is not a complete theory. Uh, he just considered a spin zero particle, and in the case of two spin half particles, spin half particles just you know like you just think of a spin either up or down. If one of them is up, the other one has to be down, or, or and vice versa. There are four conservation uh, laws in the universe. Uh, and the angular uh, momentum has to be conserved in this case. Therefore, uh, if one of them is up, the one is down. So then, <clears throat> let's assume that the blue one, so right now I'm in Pakistan, so the uh, blue one is in Pakistan, the other one is in Istanbul, okay? Red one is in Istanbul. And according to quantum mechanics, it's 50% probability wave function. So before the measurement, uh, they, it, they did not possess a spin. It's not that we, know, we don't know it, they didn't actually have it. So then, uh, uh, let's say Özgür Hocam did a measurement and then found it spin up. Then he knows that minus spin down. And uh, the thing is, you know, just before he measured it to be spin up, it was not spin up actually. He forced it to be spin up. Therefore, he did the measurement right on the spot, minus determined that it's spin down. But then how did this happen? So the information cannot uh, travel faster than speed of light. So then he was saying that the, the, the theory is not complete uh, or there is something wrong. Uh, that's why it says, okay, this is the, uh, by the way, the, the uh, uh, how do I say? Uh, first page of this paper, uh, I forgot the term for that. Uh, it says like the scientists and two colleagues, basically Einstein, uh, Podolsky and Rosen, uh, find it is not complete, quantum mechanics is not complete, even though correct. So he's not saying it's wrong, but he's, not say, he's just saying that it's not complete, something that we didn't understand yet. Now today we know that, and then he made fun of it actually, and then he said, uh, "Spooky action at a distance." In this, you know, uh, paper, which means he was making fun of it actually. Uh, but today we know that you know these two particles, uh, spin, spin state is not independent two particle. We know that they are acting like one. So in physics, we know that it is just one entity. Their uh, mathematical expression of their spin cannot be separated we call them inseparable states so they cannot be separated so in physics you can think of it like they are just like one particle they are acting like one particle so one of them has full uh, uh, correlation with the other one so then uh, in 1965 i think uh, john bell uh, of a gidenkin experiment which means a thought experiment i think your mind is still the best laboratory in the uh, in the world you should you should uh, consider this um, so basically, he just thought of this experiment where there are two entangled photons uh, or particles. Uh, the P1 and P2 are the polarizers. And then you have the polarization analyze, uh, uh, analyzers here. You just analyze their the positions. And then you basically do Einstein's uh, thought experiment in a more uh, uh, closer to the experimental configuration. And then he found this algorithm that, you know, their polarization measurement outcomes uh, in an algorithm should be less than two. Einstein was correct, which means before you actually put the polarizer and do the measurement, if the particles, the photons, do not possess a polarization, then in this case, uh, you you should it should be more than two. It can be understood why it can be more than two. But if they have some polarization, it's just we don't know it yet because we don't didn't measure it, real extent. In this case, it should be less than two. And we know that, you know, uh, in, I think in 1991 or something, I don't remember exact time, it was experimentally proven for the first time that Bell's inequality can be violated. So now we do this every day in lab. So that, that's something that we already know of, uh, that, you know, uh, we, can, we can get close to the Sivelson bound. It means quantum mechanical interpretation was correct. They did not possess uh, polarization uh, before the prior to measurement. So actually, this, is, uh, this has more meaning than what I just explained. So there's a, a philosophical uh, background as well. So, you know, that assumption, locality and realism. So according to this violation of this inequality experiment, there should be no locality, no realism, or simultaneously both of them, like which means there is no local realism. So, and the corporate interpretation is proven by this experiment. Actually, uh, so this is violation of Bell's inequality. If you see John Bell's experiment, and then uh, in 1991, a young physicist understood that, you know, if you actually violate Bell's inequality, all you need to do is have another basis to do quantum key distribution. And that's Arthur Eckert. He found this, he, he published this paper in 1991. And his whole academic career was actually based on this, this understanding. So until that time, no one actually understood this. So uh, and then this uh, quantum key distribution protocol, you just have one extra reference system, basis basically, reference system uh, that you choose for 
uh, having the key, then actually by, uh, while you are violating Bell's inequality, you're also doing quantum key distribution. Because of the time constraints, uh, and for you to have a little bit online search, I will just continue. But you know, quantum key distribution is good in the sense that uh, you know if there is an intruder in between uh, and uh, measures the state, the wave function collapses. And remember, the wave function you know we plotted that collapses, and now you have something classical, a Dirac peak. Same happens here, and then that Dirac peak, whatever the measurement outcome is, according to that, if you try to make another wave function which means another state we can never do this perfectly we always leave some fingerprint that we did some measurement before so that's called no cloning theorem so with this theorem uh by the way a violation of Bell's inequality sometimes i keep uh, getting the question that you know which one is better uh and time based protocol or the uh, bb84 which means no cloning theorem based or quantum bit error rate based uh, protocol they are identi identical things basically your state is collapsed uh, and you just have classical. So once you try to, according to the classical outcome, you try to get something quantum, you always leave some fingerprint. There's no way you can do it perfectly. So you either see it as a, a violation of Bell's value, uh, S value less than two, which means classical, or the quantum bit error rate is elevated at least 25%. So either uh, this one or that one, depending on the protocol, gives you that there is an intruder as a third party eavesdropper or adversary in your system. So therefore, it provides the uh, security uh, for delivering the key to two parties. I would like to make one remark here. Uh, quantum cryptography is not the correct term. I keep using it, I know, but it's not correct. There's nothing about cryptography or quantum cryptography. So there are symmetric cryptographic algorithms like AES. We, by the way, you're also using it on your WhatsApp. Some, like in many places, you use these encryption schemes. So what you do is you securely deliver the key so that you know uh, uh, you can use these kind of protocols. Therefore, the correct term is quantum key distribution. There is no quantum cryptography. Well, there are some quantum twirling and all these uh, advanced protocols, theoretical uh, proposals, but none of them has been observed uh, experimentally. That's why quantum cryptography experimentally does not exist yet. It's just a quantum key distribution. So for preparing measurement protocols, the most common example is the BB84. Entanglement based protocols, the most common one is ACAR91 protocols. There are pros and cons for each of them. Entanglement based protocol, basically, it's difficult, experimentally difficult to uh, uh, create it, uh, make it, because you know you are forming an interferometer. A quantum interferometer is still more sensitive, double the sensitivity. So, uh, and for prepare and measure protocols, experimentally, it's very easy, simple, straightforward to do it. But then you can only use it for quantum uh, communication or uh, uh, quantum key distribution protocols. But entanglement based protocols, basically, you can use it for many things, even distributed quantum computing, uh, like quantum internet, entanglement swapping, entangled uh, teleportation, all these advanced tests, you can do this with entanglement based protocols. That's why if we are establishing a, a quantum uh, key distribution setup, a network, I think it should be entanglement based because we don't even know if in the future, if we actually practically use uh, these kind of networks for uh, cybersecurity, but we know that they have some advantages. Uh, entanglement based protocols have some advantages that you can use for other tasks. So again, for example, let's say there are five stationary qubits in Istanbul, five stationary qubits in uh, uh, Pakistan right now, where I am. So we want to do a computation that requires 10 qubits. If you have a, a satellite that provides this entanglement in between, you can do compute your computation as if these 10 qubits are all together. So in, in fact, there is a large scale project, 1.2 billion uh, euros project, Quantum Internet Alliance. They are trying to make a pan-European uh, quantum uh, com com computer, let's say. Uh, but see, it's, on, it's capabilities is not only uh, computation, that's why they call it quantum internet. It's a really nice approach to uh, joint uh, of this quantum communication and quantum uh, computation fields. A lot of networks, I will uh, talk about them tomorrow, uh, satellite projects. I think I can uh, you know, stop here, Rajan, uh, continue tomorrow uh, with the uh, experimental uh, configurations of the uh, problem. Thank you very much for listening and sorry for uh, the delay again. No, thank you so much. So we have some questions for you, Kadirojam, in the chats, if you can read them. Uh, we constantly see, that one is the question, right? Yeah. Announcements of some company achieving the highest number of qubits 
Uh, we also have access to quantum computers and write quantum algorithms. That's correct. For example, we can implement Shor's algorithm with IBM Skiskit. However, we haven't solved a ESRS yet. So my question is at which point we can crack encryption with an available quantum computer such as IBM's? Can you also comment on the current computer computational power? Uh, yeah, that's a very nice question, by the way. Uh, I will give example. So I will give example with the Human Genome Project. Uh, when people, you know, the computers are developed and they want to like like decrypt the human genome, right? Understand the genome uh, sequence of the humans. And they were expecting around two million uh, genes on the human. Considering our complexity compared to the other animals and the plants, uh, that's what we were, uh, people were expecting, around two million. But it turned out that the a banana has 36,000 genes and we have 22,000. <laughs> So ours is less. Then how can we so complicated? How can we do so complicated tasks? It's the inter... Uh, now I, we go back to the quantum computation problem. It's not about how many qubits we have. It's about how functional each qubit is. So for example, let's say we have 10 qubits. Do you have each qubit have some interaction capability with the other qubit or not? Or just uh, the, a, a, each qubit is only interacting with the, uh, the, 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 the qubit in the neighborhood. So if that is the case, your computation capability is limited. But if everything is fully functional, you can access the, uh, any qubit and interact with the, any other qubit inside this uh, system, then that gives you another degrees of uh, capabilities. So for, for example, uh, all this, if, if you look at this IBM Skiskit, uh, the computer, so they also have this drawing of this chip, the superconducting qubits. You see that they are not having the connection the connection between all the qubits is not there. Some of them, they are not talking to each other. They have to talk to each other. So this is one of the Da Vincenzo criteria. So we don't have engineering standards for quantum computers because we don't even know what they are yet. We're trying to understand that they are very new, but we have this Da Vincenzo, Da Vincenzo criteria. Uh, and one of them is the qubits should be uh, interacting with each other. Another one is like the qubit, when you're not doing calculation, it should not just decay somewhere else. You know, like you're doing something and then like this one is just going away. You need to bring it back and then continue your calculation, which is error correction. So that's another problem. Your decoherence time is very uh, low. So we need to enhance them. So there are lots of problems, but the number of qubit is uh, just only one problem among, I don't know, tens of problems. So therefore the qubit number is important but not the only important thing. So basically a 50 qubit com computer can do better calculations than 100 qubit computer. That's possible. Uh, I hope that answered the question. And then- well, if, if they like, they can continue to ask in the chat or hopefully they can also send an email to you if they want to discuss more. So we can proceed to the other questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see this. Next. Seval wanted to ask a question loudly. About the Nuratan Altai's question, right? Yes. Seval. Okay. Yeah, this was, I think, a very nice question as well. Uh, can it be wired or wireless or both? Doesn't matter. So, about the quantum computers, uh, uh, let me give you this. Okay, uh, the superconducting qubits, they are in microwave domain. If you use ions, atoms, all these setups, they are in the optical domain. Uh, optically, it's fine because we can have entangled photons and have the mediators between them. So therefore, we can do it wireless, no problem. Uh, the communication between two uh, distant qubits, we can do it wireless with, with photons. That's perfectly fine. But uh, for uh, microwave, <clears throat> for microwave, uh, we cannot travel uh, like uh, use these microwave photons because microwave photon energy is so small that we cannot use them. It's beyond our capabilities. What we need to do is convert them to optical wavelengths or uh, infrared, uh, then use them. And then in the other side, wherever we want to transfer, we again convert them to microwave and continue. So that's why for superconducting qubit based technologies, we need this microwave to optical converters. And there is a technology that has been studied, but the efficiencies are still low, like less than 1%. I think it was 0.1% was the best value or something. Uh, they are not that practical. So if we have the uh, these nice converters with high efficiency, in even the superconducting qubit once can be uh, wireless. But uh, let me tell you one thing here. When we say wireless and wire, uh, all these things, just remember all the quantum computers will need some like really good computers to operate all these things. So I, I'm just talking about the inter-quantum computer uh, uh, 
communications capable, like interactions, all these things. Yes, they can be done uh, wirelessly. For example, atom neutral atom based or uh, ion uh, based trapped ion based quantum computer studies. Uh, they can be done uh, with photons. You can send to satellite and then co co communicate with another computer. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you for your um, nice lecture. I have a question. I want you to uh, come back to Alice and Bob examples, please. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm sharing the screen. Here. Yes. Uh, where, where was it? Stop me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yes. Here. Uh, okay. Um, entangled photon is going to from Alice to Bob. Uh, it can be. Um, it objects to uh, some mixed states, and it means changing information. Um, it means changing of information uh, from to uh, from uh, Alice to Bob going, and um, how can the purity of this um, entangled photon from uh, mixed states? Mm. Okay, uh, for the entanglement, you need a pure state. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, mixed state means they are separable, right? Yes, uh, and uh, entangled photon, one entangled photon is going to uh, from a list above. Uh, it's subject to mixed states. It can be, uh, it can subject to uh, mixed states, and uh, information can be changed. Uh, no, for, for okay. So, for example, uh, I, let me try to find if I have the uh, scheme here. I will try to show it. Okay, this is the continuation of the like, tomorrow part. It's not surprise now. Anyways, I don't have it. Okay, so let's say you have a crystal creates HH photons, horizontal horizontal photons, and then there's another crystal, vertical vertical photons. At the output, you have 50% chance that the photons coming are HH, horizontal horizontal, and the photons uh, could be 50% VV, right? So this is not entangled state. This is a mixed state which means they are separable. There are two entities. The first photon is, there, there is no correlation with the second photon. There is classical correlation, but not quantum correlation. So, but therefore, you remember this wave function is collapsing? That doesn't happen. So that is an example of mixed state. So if you want to have an entangled entanglement state, that is a pure state, which means uh, you cannot separate, uh, in, well, not pure state, let's say uh, inseparable states. Namely, can we say that uh, every entangled state is pure state? Yes, you can say that, yeah. Okay, I get it, thank but, you. But there is one thing I would like to mention that as well. Uh, you, you may have multiple degrees of entanglement, which means uh, one photon can be, well, two photons can be entangled in many degrees of freedom. Okay, there are six different ways of entangling the photons, as far as I know. There may be other ones, maybe I missed the literature. But and in one study, uh, four of them, maximally four of them uh, were carried in the photon, like uh, in, in one setup, okay? Okay, I you, get you it. You get what I mean? So one photon is carrying one bit of information in this case, right? So mm -hmm. that can be up to four in one study. And theoretically, uh, we can go up to six uh, different configurations, like which means one photon can carry six bits of information. That is huge, by the way. Okay, uh, thank you. I um, I have mixed uh, this situation with uh, um, entangled distillation. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. So maybe let's take one more question before ending the session. Cengiz Hoca has one question in the chat. Uh, Cengiz Hoca asked the question. Should we choose that one, John? Yes, uh, he has some privilege, no? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. What is the single biggest hurdle holding QKD or other quantum cryptography approaches from becoming widely used? What breakthrough is needed for widespread use of post-quantum or quantum cryptography approaches? Uh, I think, uh, Hojam, uh, intercontinental uh, quantum key distribution is formed 
Um, we know that we can even do this with the practical rates, which means we can actually use this. The problem is how do you deliver it to end user? So when you have a satellite, for example, delivering the key to Earth to locations, they are delivered to the uh, uh, optical ground stations. From there, you will need to have fibers or something to the end users, which is not easy task. I think the biggest uh, problem here is the uh, quantum repeaters. If we have repeaters, we can arbitrarily uh, extend the distance and uh, uh, we can also deliver to end users without any problem. Just like, okay, because we are having the analogy from the, the telecom fibers, you know, for example, Turf Telecom has this fiber network. Why don't we use it for quantum key distribution? Because they have relays. Every 100 meters or something, they measure the signal and then amplify it and then send again. That's what the relay does. So we have lots of relays between like uh, two parties communicating in this fiber networks, like classical uh, telecom uh, networks. But we cannot do this in quantum. Once you measure it, the quantum properties are gone. So therefore, we need some quantum repeater, which means uh, that can do this without uh, causing some fingerprints. So to do that, we need a quantum memory, basically quantum uh, uh, repeater. Once we have this, they can be used as relays. But then there is this problem. I mean, people try to study uh, quantum uh, uh, repeaters uh, out of cold atom setups, BEC, you know, like all these expensive things. Who wants to put relays like that? So it's not practical. So it's nice to study these things, but uh, the quantum repeaters are not practical in a sense that you can only do them in the lab. You can show them in the lab. I know Arhan Salamirek has really nice works on that one, but you know, you cannot just take their lab setup and make a relay too expensive. So for these technologies, I think it, it can, they can only have certain like uh, limited use, like a campus, limited campus area use or something like that. And uh, to do that, I think we need quantum computers to be a real threat. Uh, so that people actually want to use this. But again, not the public. I mean, I don't think we will ever be using quantum key distribution for, uh, you know, uh, secure communication. But uh, some clients for the banks, you know, like, like really large scale, they are using, for example, couriers to bring the key, the hard drive, so that they use this for uh, authentication and then they uh, uh, do the transaction. So for, for them, for example, definitely a, a quantum key distribution would be a, a cheaper solution than having this uh, courier network. <laughs> uh, so therefore, I think it's about the use case. Uh, like, I don't think everyone will be using the quantum key distribution ever. I'm not sure if that... Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, John. Very, very nice question. Thank you very much. Very, very good answer also. And thank you so much, Kadir Ojem, again. So please also make a note of the other questions uh, in, the, in the chat before you leave, uh, because I can see several more very good questions. So you can contact them by email or they can access you via email. So I'm also happy to see that we are cracking some ice with the audience and we are getting more and more questions after each talk. So let's keep this trend on and we will see you in the evening session. Thank you for your participation.